In late May, protests against systemic racism erupted across the country. Months later, those demonstrations continue, building on a long tradition of civil rights activism in the United States. I'm Giovanna Romano Sanchez, and you're listening to Here and Now at the Huntington, a podcast from the Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens. In this episode, we look back at the work of Lauren Miller, one of the activists whose extraordinary work significantly advanced civil rights in the country. And we ask what his legacy can tell us about the fight against racism today. When we read about the American civil rights movements, some familiar names come to mind. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Angela Davis, Thurgood Marshall. But most of us probably haven't heard of Lauren Miller. Lauren Miller was more or less everywhere in American racial politics for several decades of the 20th century. This is Kenneth Mack, professor of law and affiliate professor of history at Harvard University. There are many other lawyers who we know from the civil rights movement, but Lauren Miller is a name who we don't know uh, that much and about whom we should know more. Miller was one of the most important lawyers of the civil rights era. In his work with the NAACP, he played a key part in several landmark cases, including Brown v. Board of Education and Shelley v. Kramer. He was also an influential writer and editor, the owner of two black newspapers in California. We mostly know him as the principal lawyer in the restrictive covenant cases. Uh, restrictive covenants were uh, one of the means that African Americans were denied the ability to own homes and were denied uh, wealth and privileges. And Miller, more than anyone else, was responsible for the litigation that finally invalidated the racially restrictive covenants in the Supreme Court in a case called Shelley versus Kramer. Well, that was one of the problems. Negroes had not yet won their way into public employment. This uh, is Laura Miller, during an interview recorded in 1967. Except in the post office, Negroes, for example, did not uh, work in the county court civil service. And I recall that the clerk of the court at that time said that as long as he was cl clerk of the court, no Negro would ever work. Miller was born in 1903 in Pender, Nebraska. He was the second of seven children. His father was a former slave. His mother was a white Midwesterner. This is Dr. Amina Hassan, a scholar and researcher who wrote the biography Laura Miller, civil rights attorney and journalist. He was always a good student, and eventually he went off to college. After graduating from University of Kansas, Miller went to law school. But it wasn't really what he wanted to do. He went to law school because it was what his father wanted him to do. After getting his law degree, Miller became a fierce critic of mainstream civil rights lawyers. In an award-winning essay called College, he writes about how limiting it would be for him to follow that career path. He says, Oh yes, your career. You must have a career. You will be a lawyer after all. A lawyer to confound those fools with their own laws giving life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You will show them just how far you will rise in spite of them. You will be ruthless and make them give you a place. You plunge into law. You secretly loathe it. You still find yourself writing bitter little sketches, tragic beats of verse, but you repress them. Then you find your superlative emotions slowly receding. He was passionate about the written and the spoken word. He wanted to be a writer. And he did write for some time. After getting his law degree, 
Miller moved to Los Angeles and served as the editor of the California Eagle, the oldest black newspaper in the city. He ended up buying the paper later in life and also co-founded the Los Angeles Sentinel. Miller also wrote a book called The Petitioners. But even though it was his passion, writing didn't pay the bills. And after getting married, Miller turned back to law. And that's what put, you know, food on the table. He eventually started his own firm. And he really got a lot out of practicing law. He was helping people in a really direct way. As a lawyer, Miller earned a reputation for having a sharp intellect and dynamic presence. So much so that his friend and client, Don Wilden, said that other lawyers would postpone their cases so they could watch Miller in action. Lauren Miller was someone who had the courage of his convictions. He was not afraid of racial politics. During World War II, Miller joined the ACLU in challenging the U.S. order to evict and incarcerate people of Japanese descent. He also worked on cases that helped integrate the U.S. military and the Los Angeles Fire Department. According to Dr. Hassan, by the time Miller stood before the Supreme Court in 1948, he had tried more racial covenant cases than any other lawyer in the country. As Professor Mack said, Miller was pretty much everywhere in racial politics during the 50s and 60s. So I would see Lauren Miller mentioned in other lawyers' papers. I would see bits and pieces about him all over the place. And he wondered about Miller's archives. So when Professor Mack started doing research for his book on civil rights attorneys, called Representing the Race, the Creation of the Civil Rights Lawyer, it turned out that I was on vacation in Jamaica, and I was on a, a little bus that, that would take you from, I think, the airport to, my, to your resort. And I was on the bus with a lawyer from Los Angeles, and we got to talking, and he said his name was Halver Miller. And I said, well, are you related to Lauren Miller? And he said, that's my uncle. And I said, well, does he have any papers? And he said, yeah, he has plenty of papers. They're sitting in a garage. And I was floored. When Professor Mack heard this, he encouraged the family to send the papers to an archive. That's important because in an archive, the documents can be properly preserved and made accessible to researchers. Around that time, curators at the Huntington also approached the family about bringing Miller's documents to the institution. And eventually, Lauren Miller's papers landed at the Huntington. Clay Stalls is our curator of California and Hispanic collections. He's responsible for caring for the Miller's documents. Miller knew everybody. Thurgood Marshall, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, all these persons are major, major figures. And Miller's correspondence with them is found in his papers. So, if Miller was such an important figure, why then is he not better known today? Dr. Hassan has two theories. The one is that he was out west. The majority of history or books or what people write about is either the East Coast or the South when it comes to Black people. The other thing is that he was extremely close to communists. He was no more different than anyone else who of a progressive mind who was a communist during the 30s because the Communist Party at that time was the only organization that dealt with racism, inequality. So it was just natural. Miller ended up distancing himself from communism later in life. But Dr. Hassan believes that he remained stigmatized for his political sympathies. He always denied that he was a card-curing communist, but he remained a Marxist. He had what they call the pink tinge. The FBI hounded him and harassed him for the rest of his life. He was under surveillance and he was never sure when it was going to pop up again. To Professor Mack, more than the stigma, what really makes it difficult for people to remember Miller is the fact that it's hard to categorize his work. Miller was a complex figure. He had this incredible evolution of his politics. 
in the middle of the 1930s, he was the leading critic of mainstream civil rights lawyers. But then he became a lawyer and he was really good at it. So it is just a, an incredible and strange and unexpected journey. And on each step of the journey, he did something important and lasting. Laura Miller was appointed municipal court judge in 1964 by Governor Pat Brown, and he worked until his death three years later. He never stopped writing. In fact, in his 60s, he wrote an op-ed defending a Black movement called Freedom Now. It wasn't yet Black power, but it was all about trying to think about something new. And Lauren wrote a kind of in-your-face uh, op-ed when he was a man in his 60s about the Freedom Now movement, celebrating it and kind of poking at white liberals to say that here's where the future comes from. So even though Miller died more than 50 years ago, I think it's possible to imagine where he would be these days if he were alive. It is easy to see, envision him writing in support of something like Black Lives Matter. He was always current with whatever the leading edge of the protest movement was. He was always willing to tell unvarnished truths about race, truths that made many white liberals uncomfortable. And certainly that's what's happening with the movement for Black Lives today. Between cell phones and body cameras, more and more white people are forced to confront these unvarnished truths about race in America. Nothing has really changed. The wage gap between blacks and white hasn't changed since the 1950s. The good thing, I, I guess, was happening is that the technology has changed people's perceptions. But I'm a realist. It's been 400 years, and essentially very little has changed, and it's only come through constant struggle. That's why Laura Miller was so important. Through his writing and legal practice, he fought to overturn racist policies in housing and school segregation. And he helped pave a way for future movements. We have to know history. We, we learn from history. History shows us how we got here how certain problems that we grapple with today arose, what people in the past tried to do about them. And history is a source of learning. It's a source of inspiration. And we can both learn and be inspired by Lauren Miller's story. Here and Now at the Huntington is produced by the Huntington Library, Art Museum and Botanical Gardens. The clip from Lauren Miller's 1967 interview is courtesy of the Lawrence de Graaf Center for Oral and Public History, California State University, Fullerton. Thanks for listening and stay well. Yeah.